Welcome to Casual Friday. So this week was full of, of confusion and, and wonderment and excitement and revelations and some bad news and some good news uh, all in one week. And that's what I'll be talking about in this episode of Casual Friday. I'll also, I'll put links down in the description to help you jump along if you'd like to skip ahead or jump back. So let's start with the bad news and get that over with. Uh, last week I was talking about how I had done the shop hop here in the Twin Cities a year ago and that I had found a shop up in Circle Pines, which is half hour north of where I live, and that I really liked the shop because she had things that other shops didn't have, including very large selections of solid color yarns in a variety of yarn weights and that I had been back there three or four times since then, specifically because her uh, inventory was different from most of the other shops in the area. Somebody posted in the Ravelry thread on last week's Casual Friday video that she had just announced that she was going to be closing her store. Her landlord had sold the building, her, the new landlord was not going to renew her lease and she hadn't found a suitable uh, place in the, in the surrounding area to continue her shop. So she was going to be closing it and that today, I'm recording this on Thursday, uh, and that today uh, the shop would uh, open with 25% off of everything, which that's the good news. <laughs> um, so I had already had a plan today that I was going to go out and buy a a few balls of yarn of worsted weight yarn in a couple of different colors so I thought I'll just go up there and 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 check it out and um, so I actually bought a lot of worsted weight yarn I, I, I keep saying I'm not a stasher but I do need yarns for doing technique videos I do a lot of knitting that never it that never turns into a project never shows up on camera because I'm swatching and experimenting and so I go through a lot of worsted weight yarn um, for that. I bought a, a, just a ton of different colors. And then I also thought, well, I'll just take a look around the shop and see if there's anything interesting. Because I also have this goal this year of kind of pushing, pushing my boundaries on what sorts of yarns I've worked with in the past. So the color knitting is, is part of what I'm pushing myself. But another thing is just uh, working with different... Um, wools to find out what different uh, breeds are like. So let me just pull these out. Uh, what I found was that she had uh, a display of blue face luster yarn. Now I've heard about this plenty of times, but I had never encountered it in any of the shops that I frequent. Maybe they carried them. I just didn't notice. Uh, so I thought, oh, blue face luster. That's one of the yarns that I would like to try. So I grabbed hold of it on the, on the display and I was like, ooh, ooh, I like this. I like this. Really like it a lot. So they had two, two colors they had. They're both natural colors. One is a white, white natural. One is a brown natural. So I bought one of each and they're from Yorkshire, which is, I was so happy to see that um, because of my connection to Yorkshire having been there and having um, my ancestors came from Yorkshire. So I was really happy with that. But then on the display, they had all these little balls of, um, it's, it's um, British blue wool, pure British blue face Lester wool from Erica Knight made in England. And they're 25 gram little balls. So I, I bought some, some grays and, and black and a rose color. And then this kind of pale spring green that I like and um, and then I have the now these two are from West Yorkshire spinners but they're also blue blue face Lester so I'm looking forward to to trying these out and seeing how they work and especially trying um, these little balls doing some color work I was thinking about expanding my color work experiments that I've been doing with the with the Latvian mittens and and trying some things to see how that how it works with those particular yarns so that's that's kind of my good news bad news in terms of yarn shops it you know the, the yarn shops in the Twin Cities they do change owners sometimes and sometimes they they change ownership and they continue their name and so it's the same shop that you've always gone to and then sometimes 
um, they get bought out and then they change their name. And that has happened a few times in the past year. There have been a couple of shops that the owners retired and they sold the shop and then the new owners have renamed them. Then you get these ones like W where they don't want to close, um, but they can't, they can't find an economical, financially sound way of continuing um, based on the space available to them in their area. And then the shop where I taught for years, that shop had been around for more than 40 years, had, had changed owners over the years, maintained its name, and then the, this owner uh, wanted to retire and couldn't find somebody who wanted to um, buy out that shop. So. It happens, but then new shops open, like like there's a new shop near me. It's small. Uh, if you live in the Twin Cities, it's in Edina at the 50th in France location. It's called Harriet, Harriet and Alice, and it's the, named after the woman's two grandmothers. Uh, and it's a small shop. It's right by my dentist, so I go buy it. <laughs> I've been by it a few times, and um, it's a nice little shop. Um, but so they, new shops do, do appear and they change hands, but it's, it is sad when one closes that I was particularly attached to. I wish that wouldn't happen. So I had my second Latvian Mitten class this past Saturday. Uh, last week I had almost nothing to show for it because I'd ripped out the cuff. It was not working. I was really struggling with the three colors per round, like how to manage the colors and, and what to do. And my first attempt, I had forgotten to go up a, a needle size, so it was just too tight. And my second attempt is better, but I'm still not completely happy with the tension. So here, here's what I have. So let me get this out of the way. Here's what I have so far. Um, and what it looks pretty good from a distance but i really don't like the tension on this so on the upper part the little red there's little blips of red so there's a third color every seventh row but it's really occasional just in the center of those little white kind of tic-tac-toe looking things but down here the white and the black are really even and the, the or the the red and the black are even and the white is the background and that was where I was struggling with tension. So I think, um, well, I know, <laughs> and I'm going to confirm this when we have our class next, our final class next week, is that I think there were some assumptions going on with how to handle, uh, how, to, how to do what I would call stranded color work. Like I would call this, like the generic term for this is what I would call stranded color work. Where Fair Isle is a subset of stranded color work. Fair Isle has very you know, sort of narrow rules about uh, two only two colors in every round and no more than five stitches of one color before you switch to the other. So the shorts are, the floats are short and you don't have to trap long floats um, the way you might in other stranded color work where there might be very long separations um, between when a color makes an appearance in the round. So that was what I always think of it as stranded color work, um, which I'll talk about in a little bit. So the when we ha when we had our second class, we're all talking about the sort of the challenges that we're having with the color work, and I, I noticed a woman uh, next to me had had done a really nice job on hers, and I asked her how how did you uh, manage the three colors, and she said, well, I just knit with one, and then I would drop it, and then I pick up the next one and work with that, and I drop it, and I thought, okay, well that's 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 one way of doing it, <laughs> and I you know I prefer to have uh, a yarn in each hand. And then the, the two yarns run in parallel on the back of the work. And one of them will run along the top and one will run along the bottom. And the one that runs along the bottom is going to create larger stitches. And, and that's usually the color that you choose for your foreground. So that creates the pattern. And then the color that runs along the top on the back of the work um, creates the background and those stitches tend to be a little smaller. So you have to think about well which hand are you going to hold a yarn in? And then another woman was saying oh well, I just pick whichever in any particular round whichever color has the most stitches and I hold that one in one hand 
And I said, oh, well, then that changes the yarn dominance in you know, each round. She's like, oh. <laughs> so none of us have seen our teacher knit. We've asked her about it, like, oh, how do you knit? Do you hold the yarn in your right hand or left hand? She'd say, oh, I hold it in my left hand. I, I, hold both, I hold both colors in both colors in my left hand. And we didn't, somebody asked her, well, do you knit Eastern uncrossed or do you knit Western? And she didn't really know what that meant. But Eastern uncrossed is when the stitches are sitting on the needle so that the leading leg, the leg closest to the tip of the needle hangs over the back, that's Eastern. And Western is what is expected in English language uh, patterns where the leading leg hangs over the front. So when, you, when you're knitting, we say you knit through the front. Um, but there's a woman in the class who knits, whose stitches always sit opposite, so she knits through the back. So the teacher didn't know what that was about. So we said, oh, she's probably a Western knitter. But we didn't ask, we didn't ask other questions. So in the second class, some of the people were talking, the one of the challenges they were having was, well, the, the yarn colors are getting twisted with each other. And, she, and the teacher said, oh, there's a way of dealing with that. And she showed us, she's like, you know, you, you anchor the yarns in the ball um, so that they, you know, they won't pull out and you let them dangle from the work and they dangle and then they untwist. And um, you just do that every so often and they untwist. And my reaction to it, mentally to that was, well, you know, if you're, if you're keeping them parallel, if you're keeping the floats parallel to each other, they never twist. So, you know, that's, they're doing, they're doing something wrong is what I was thinking in my head. They're doing, you would never have that. I mean, it's the kind of thing that I was taught to do when I learned twined knitting. Twined knitting is also called two-end knitting. It's when you have two strands of yarn. They could be different colors or they could be the same color. And every stitch, you, you drop one color and then you pick up the other. You're always bringing it up from underneath so that the yarns are twisting around each other every stitch. So if you're only working in one color, you have two strands the same color and you're always twisting around every single stitch and it creates a, a two-layered, you know, a thick uh, fabric so that it's, it's warmer than just a single strand of yarn. And there are all these textured decorative things you can do. So one of the elements in Latvian mittens are what the, are called Latvian braids. And I'll, well, I'll do a close-up of that so you can see it better. And Latvian braids use that technique that twined knitting uses, where you're alternating between two different colors, and every, so every stitch you're always bringing under, bringing under, bringing under, and the yarns get twisted around each other. But the Latvian braid has worked for two rounds, so on the next round, when you're alternating, you bring the yarn over, you bring the yarn over, you bring the yarn over. So at the end of the second round, the yarns are untwisted. So I'm looking at our teacher and she's showing how to do this untwisting thing, which is what I learned in twined knitting and knowing that Latvian brains, braids are, are a type of twined knitting. Um, I thought, well, that's, huh. You know, I just made, kind of made a mental note of it. And, and I hadn't, when I got home, I, I was working, I, you know, but at the end of the class, I was probably, you know, right here on the mitten and I was, I was working, uh, working with it. And I thought, I'm just going to, I'm going to, look through my books again and see if I can find anything that that mentions anything about how to handle three colors. Now there's never going to be anything about how to handle three colors in in books that are exclusively about fair isle knitting because fair isle knitting specifically will only use two colors per round. It won't ever have three. So I'm looking at all my books, my general reference books. I'm looking in, in, in my reference books that have stranded color work um, that also includes not just Fair Isle, but other like Swedish and Norwegian and um, Baltic states and Andy and knitting, all of those. They all have different types of motif, that, motifs that are particular to their culture. And, uh, and so I'm looking through none of them, none of them mention anything about what to do with the three colors. Every single one of them talks about uh, how you can hold both colors in your left hand, both colors in your right hand, or one in each hand, and that you want to keep these you know, floats parallel. Now they do a lot of times talk about if you do have a long float that you want to trap that float and that there's two ways of doing that. One of them is, is the weaving method. 
um, where you can trap trap a float. And the other is that you can twist the yarn around um, around the other yarn uh, if the floats are too long. Now weaving, the weaving method is also just a method of working two color knitting where if you are working more than two stitches, so if you're working three or more stitches in a row of the same color, then you would do this weaving or trapping business uh, every couple of stitches. So you can do that for everything, uh, not just for if you need one especially long float. Um, but I, I've never liked the weave. It's more time consuming. So my preference is just to use it when I need to and to use weaving because it doesn't, it doesn't twist up the stitches or twist up the yarns around each other um, over twisting yarns, yarns around each other. Now some knitting books have told, have, have, have said to, you know, twist the yarns every time you change colors when you're doing stranded color work, which is ridiculous and with the idea that oh, it prevents holes and it's that's a ridiculous concept you don't get holes with stranded color work um, that's that's a false reason for wanting to twist the colors and some books have said to do that in the past but they don't tend to do that now so I looked through all my books there's nothing about how to manage three colors so I went on the internet and I don't know why I didn't do this before, before but I didn't so I, I couldn't find much on the internet either I, uh, I found Tech Knitter had a blog post. She's excellent. She's got excellent blog posting. And in her posts, she said, you know, technically you could do all three in one hand or all three in the other. And then she personally wasn't able to do that. And so she, she gave an example of what she does and she keeps one yarn in her right hand and then she handles the other two in her left hand and using her thumb in between the two strands to kind of keep them separate when she's got to pick one, um, color versus the others. So that was her method. And then I found a video online and it was a woman who was doing an Icelandic wool uh, sweater with the, the yoke in three colors per row. And her approach was to have one color in the left hand and two colors in the right hand, but she only held on to one color at a time. And when she switched the color, from one color to another in her right hand, she did that business of bringing the yarn under, the new yarn under the yarn that she had been using so that those two yarns twist around each other. So in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, if you're twisting those yarns around each other, they're not parallel anymore. So what does that do to, to the yarn dominance? Does that, and, and if those two are, to, two are in your right hand, those two, like, they become equal in size and, um, and are both considered background colors. Then could you do that in the right hand where you had the background, what, the single background color in your right hand, and then you twist the two in your right hand so that neither one of those were dominant over the other, but they were still parallel to the background color. So I thought, well, that's an interesting idea. Then you have to decide, well, do I have two background colors or do I have two foreground colors? And it was just this idea that was coming to me. And this woman who was demonstrating the Icelandic wool sweater mentioned that, oh, it's like when you work a Latvian braid, if you've ever done that, the same process where you're bringing it under. You're just not doing it every stitch, you're just doing it when the color changes. And then I started to think, maybe that's how the Latvians handle their multicolor knitting because some of their designs have four or five colors in a round. And like, how, how on earth would you keep five colors parallel? I mean, you could do it, but it would be tedious. And it just seemed to me that there had to be an efficient way to do that. And then how would you choose which one was dominant? Because you're gonna, the, the one that's, that's lowest is going to be most dominant. The one that's highest is gonna be least dominant. How do you make that determination when also you're dealing with these colors? It just seemed a little, it just seemed like there had to be an easier way. But I did wonder if that's, if that's what, if that was the secret to Latvian knitting. So I looked at my Latvian mitten book again. I couldn't, I couldn't see it see that there was anything about how to handle the yarns at all in there as I was just looking through the topics. Didn't see anything about it in there. So then I remembered that a couple of women in the Latvian mitten class had mentioned there was a Ravelry group called Knit Like a Latvian and that they, they thought it was really a helpful resource. 
So I thought, well, I'm going to look there because I bet they'll have like uh, some locked threads or or group pages. Like when you when you have a, a group on Ravelry, like in my group, you can have um, they have what are called tabs at the top of the the screen. So one is the discussion tab. So then that's where all the, the conversation threads are. And then there's one called pages. And in my group, I have a page that has links to all my interweave uh, knit articles. I have another page that has all the links to my Ask a Knitter articles. I have one that has uh, links to all of my videos from 2017 and then a fourth page with all the links to my videos from 2018. So I thought, well, there's a good chance that they'll have some pages with resources in there because that group has been around for since Ravelry started and it's tons of people. It's a really active group. So I started looking and they had like references for books and things, but I wasn't seeing anything about, you know, handling the multiple colors and, and, and yarn dominance, like how color dominance, how to, you know, how to figure that out. Like when you have so many colors. Uh, so I, I couldn't find anything in those kinds of places. So I decided to do a search just on the discussion threads and I found a discussion thread from eight months ago that had some answers in it. And that was when I started, like my brain started like frizzling and I was started to get really excited. Because I, you know, I wondered about this idea of, of managing, uh, col managing the yarns by just twisting around them. And I thought, what if you did like the Latvian braid? Like the first round you'd always pull under each color. Every time you change the color, you just pulled under and it would be twisting around each other. But then on the next round, you could you could t go the other way, just like with a Latvian braid. And then maybe you would eliminate the twisting. You wouldn't have to hold it up and let them, un let them untwist every so often. But I also wanted to confirm that this idea of pulling the yarn under was maybe what they were doing in Latvian mittens. So I found this thread. Apparently in Latvia, they had these knitting retreats which who knew um which where they they teach about the culture and and the mittens and all that kind of thing and there were, had been one last spring or summer or summer probably and some people had gone to it so they're posting uh, their experiences there and photos and stuff and um somebody posted in the in there that there had been a marketplace with all the mittens and they had taken photos of them before but that this time they turned them inside out so they could see how the color management was working. And what they noticed was that in mittens that had two colors, they were parallel floats, but anything with four or more colors had these, they call them rotating floats. And I can't remember what the three colors, if those were parallel or not, they may have been, I don't remember. But, and then another woman posted a swatch that she had done that she uses when she teaches to show how that yarn dominance uh, works. So that if you have the parallel floats and you have the, the dominant yarn in your left hand, left hand uh, and the background color in your right hand, what that looks like and then what it looks like when you do this rotating floats and then, you know, when you switch switch hands for the parallel floats. So I did a swatch like that myself. And we'll see if you can see on here. You can, if you, if you look at the bottom, you see how the red is more dominant. That was where I held the red in my left hand and the gray in my right hand. And up here, let's see, it's probably, let me see this one. Okay. So, and then in the middle part here is where I was bringing the yarn under every time when I switch. And so the colors are balanced. And then up here, I did parallel floats again, gray hand, a gray yarn in my left hand, a red in my right, and the gray is dominant. So on this half of the round, I was bringing the yarn under every time. But then on this half of the round, I was bringing the yarn over every time. And this is the tip I got from a woman who, who had posted the swatch like this. So for the first half of the round, she's bringing it under every time, which twists twist them around each other. And then the second half, she's going over, twisting around each other. So by the time she gets to the end of the round, nothing's twisted. And if she always does that, first half of the round always under, second half always over, 
um, when they're stacked on top of each other, they're fine. If you do around where you're doing under and then around where you're pulling over, you get kind of a, a zigzaggy effect. It was, it was a huge revelation. So that was a great tip, like switching at the half rounds. So if that wasn't enough <laughs> excitement for me, like confirming that this was a thing, this rotating floats, which I hadn't had a word for before, uh, that it was a thing and that it eliminated dominance. Like it just made all of the color, all of the, every color, all the stitches were the same size. Well, then this other, this man from Sweden pipes in and he says, oh, I'm writing um, a master's thesis on multicolor knitting. And there are four ways of handling um, multicolor knitting and only the parallel floats method has yarn dominance. And so he mentioned, you know, the parallel floats, one in each hand or in both hands, but keeping one, uh, both yarns in one hand where one yarn's always above and one's below. Then there's the twined knitting method where you're, every stitch you're twisting, whether you're changing color or not. Uh, then there's the um, rotating floats method where when you change colors, you bring the new color either under every time or over every time. And then there's that weaving method that we talked about. So only parallel floats causes yarn dominance. And I thought, oh my God, you know, there's, you don't even have to worry about it if you use one of these other methods. So that there, there's an advantage and there are advantages and disadvantages to each of these four methods, but I had never once heard of this rotating uh, float method. So once again, I went through my books to see if anything was in there and there was not. I did look through my Mittens of Latvia book again more carefully and buried in the text, like there was no pictures or anything about handling the yarn, buried in the text was there was a paragraph that mentioned um, when you're working with multiple colors as in example, you know, 178 or whatever it was, um, where there was this one color where it was on this side of the row and this side of the row, there was a big span in between. She talked about, talked about how you're always bringing the yarn underneath every time. So then that was the indication that that really was the traditional way, a way of working. So this man who was writing his master's thesis, I thought, well, that's really, you know, that's a really interesting thing. He said it hadn't been approved yet. And this was like eight months ago. And he doesn't post on Ravelry, Ravelry very often. I went and looked to see his other posts and there was nothing else about it. Um, well, because I had responded to this thread that was from eight months ago. And it's like, I know it's an old thread, but this is amazing. I had no idea about the rotating floats thing. This is fantastic. And uh, thank you so much. One of the moderators said, um, let's start two new threads uh, about a handling management of color of, of the, the strands and then one on color dominance. So she started two new threads. Well, in that thread, somebody posted a link to that Swedish man's master's thesis. And I went and I looked at it and it had just been published the week before in English. Like he wrote it in, in Swedish and then he translated it into English and he did a great job. That tornado drill went on for 10 minutes. <laughs> I don't even know where I was, what I was talking about before. Oh, okay, I remember now. So this guy, his name is Ole Petter. Uh, I can't remember his last name, but I'll, pu I'll put a link down below. Somebody in these new threads that were started on handling multiple strands and color dominance, somebody posted a link to Ole Petter's um, master's thesis. And, um, and I read it, 70 pages on multicolor knitting. <laughs> it's like, I was practically shaking. I was so I was so excited. It was 70 pages long and my like my heart was pounding. I'm reading this. Like I had to like calm myself down so I could concentrate on what I was reading. And what his thesis was on was uh he, what he did was that he he examined I think he looked originally at like 600 knitting manuals and then he narrowed it down to 100 and something based on the ones that actually addressed multicolor knitting. And that's where I realized that the term stranded knitting is really 
only applies when you're using parallel floats. It doesn't apply when you're doing weaving. It doesn't apply when you're doing twining and it doesn't apply when you're doing this rotating floats. Stranded color work really, I think only applies to the parallel floats method. Maybe it applies to rotating floats, but I don't know. Um, so I think it's more correct to say the generalized term is multicolor knitting. So he, he wanted to look at all of these books and then and see which methods were described in books from like North America, so the United States and Canada versus the UK versus Northern Europe. So he looked at books that were published in English, Swedish, and German. And he, the, the books from the Baltic states, which is where Latvia is, really hadn't been translated into any of these languages. We're starting to see some now, like this Mittens of Latvia um, book um, that I got. Oh, I just realized I took my glasses off. Hold on a second. Ugh. I can't see myself in my monitor without my glasses. Um, so the Mittens of, of Latvia book, what, what came out four or five years ago, and it's just now coming out in English. So I think there's some other books like that too. But previous manuals weren't translated. They were, you know, they were part of the USSR, so those books just didn't get translated. So we haven't seen how other books, other cultures maybe handle the yarns. And so he was looking at how in different time periods they, they told you how to manage uh, different, different uh, methods. And then he wanted to, to see if you could determine in any particular region like that, whether there was a tradition of managing the yarn in a certain way. And he, def he, he cited a source for what a tradition is. And a tradition would be, you know, some sort of um, procedure or method or whatever that gets passed along for three generations. So something might be a trend or the fashion for even a couple of decades, but that doesn't make it a tradition. So he wanted to see if he could if he could figure out what a particular area what their tradition actually was um, because he was born in 1946 and he learned to knit when he was 11 so he learned to knit in the mid in the mid 50s and I don't believe he was living in Sweden at the time and because he was a boy he wouldn't have been taught knitting in school like the girls would have been he would have it would have been like woodwork and and metalwork and things like that. So, but the job his father had, they lived in different parts of the world. And so they had servants who were from various countries and they taught him how to knit. And so his preference is to manage the yarn in the right hand. What he mentioned was that in, in the middle of the 20th century, the Swedish government decided to standardize the curriculum in the schools. And so that, so that all students would be learning the same curriculum from the same books across the entire country. And so the woman, they, they, they assigned this woman to be the person to write the knitting instruction manual. And, and she instructed to hold, handle the yarn in the left hand. So that's how the teachers then instructed their students to manage the yarn was in the left hand. So, Anyone who learned to knit from that point onward in school holds the yarn in their left hand. That doesn't mean that that was the traditional way of doing it in Sweden. That just means that the government, you know, created this standardized uh, teaching method and then all the people from that point forward were taught that method. So that's what he was trying to figure out is if from books, if you look at all these other books, is there a way to determine that? If, are there certain patterns and, and do they change over time? In his thesis, he describes the four different methods and he, and he describes what he has noticed in, in different books and that you can see that this weaving method uh, is limited to Anglo-Saxon countries, which I assume means North America and UK. I think is what he means by Anglo-Saxon countries. And you don't see it at all in the Nordic countries. You don't see that weaving method at all. And that this business of the rotating floats isn't mentioned as often and is practically disappeared uh, from manuals at this point. And you know, that it's a real shame. It would be a real shame to lose one of these methods because Ola Peter uh, thinks the way I think, which is that 
that you should know all your options because any particular knitting situation um, may warrant using a different technique than you would normally use. So for example, that parallel floats version holding a one yarn in each hand for me works great. Keeps my yarn, keeps, I, I know which, which yarn is, is which and I can handle one with each color. They don't get tangled around each other. It works fine if I'm using two colors. But the Latvians don't use just two colors. They use multiple colors. And so even though you get the yarns get twisted and they have to be untwisted at the end of every round or two. You have the advantage of the yarns get, um, being trapped um, by this twisting and not having to do this uh, trapping by the weaving method. So there, there are some real advantages to that, to it when you're using so many different colors. And this was this just this huge revelation to me and it got me so excited. It also, it started me on this, you know, thinking about things in a very different way um, than, than I had before when it, when it came to color work. So when I was going through all my books looking for anything about three color knitting and, and, and how you might want to do that, I was looking in my uh, Knitter's Handbook. It's the Reader's Digest Knitter's Handbook uh, by Monse Stanley. Um, there was a chart. I don't know if I'd ever seen it before. If I had, I forgot. I had forgotten it. Uh, and it was a chart that talked about color values. Because one of the things that Ole Petter had pointed out was that color dominance and yarn dominance are not the same thing. And I had always used those terms pretty interchangeably, just not, just not, you know, the yarn, the dominant yarn is the, is the dominant color. Um, the big stitches are, are what's dominant, whether we t you speak about it in terms of the yarn or the color, because you kind of mean the same thing often when you're working with multiple colors. And so his point was that dark yarns tend to recede while really light yarns tend to tend to pop out more. So if the stitches are all the same size, you're still going to have certain colors that are going to pop more than others. Some are going to disappear into the background more. And I thought, well, that was a really good point. So in this knitter's handbook, there was a chart about color value and it had colors like listed from like black, navy, rusts and burgundies, and you know, blues, greens, purples, all of those, all the way down to white. And then it had light, medium, and dark values. And for each color family, like the blacks or the burgundies or the blues, uh, it, it assigned a numeric value to the light, the medium, and the dark values. Well, something like black or navy it gets a low number, a one, no matter what, because there isn't really such a thing as light navy or light black. Um, then you're starting to get into grays. So, so you might find like a, a light rust has the same color value as a medium blue, for example. So if you're wanting to make co uh, yarn, uh, color substitutions in a pattern, uh, that's one way to determine if that color pattern is going to work out the same is that if you're picking colors, if you're substituting a rust for a blue, if they both have the same color value, then, then it might work out. Whereas if you pick something that had a much higher, much lower value, then the pattern might get more difficult. And so all of this is based on, there's a photographer who took 118 different colors and photographed them in black and white and then kind of assigned them these eight different uh, color values. And I thought, well, that, that would be a way of thinking of, I, I'm not sure I'm thinking about this. This might be a way of determining dominance as well. So if you have yarn, if you have no yarn dominance, but you still want color do dominance, then you can use those numeric values to kind of help guide you. So these are the kinds of tools that I was looking for. Like when I was, you know, so intimidated by color because of my color blindness that I, I wanted to see if I could find some tools, a systematic way of, of addressing, uh, some of the issues that that require so much swatching when you're working with color work. I mean, there's still going to be a lot of swatching involved, but just having a set of tools and guidelines that I can use while I start playing with color. So these are the things that, that are exciting me this week, but really what, what I think it all came down to was that was that I was making an assumption. I think most of us in this class were making an assumption about uh, 
what was supposed to be going on on the back of the work, like this idea of the parallel floats, at least in my mind, that was like the right way to do it. In the master hand knitting program, when we did stranded color work, it was fair aisle, which meant that there are those very specific uh, uh, rules and we didn't have to trap floats and we were requ we were told specifically not to use the weaving method we had to use the stranded method so i had interpreted that along with all of the stuff that i see in the in the manuals that i have available to me i interpreted that to mean that parallel floats was the right or best practices method of working with multiple colors and i don't think that that's correct anymore and i think it's a disservice not to point out uh, to knitters that you can avoid yarn dominance if you want to and that that and that there's there are advantages and disadvantages to other methods but this whole assumptions thing is really what's behind all of the confusion for me and also part of me just glossing over the few places where there was some information about rotating floats. So I do try to be careful about assumptions and and I, I try not to let people get away with generalizations if they say something to me like, oh, it's gonna take a while. And I try to pin down, well, what do you mean by a while? Do you mean three days or three weeks? You know, wh what does that mean to you? So in knitting, I think, because we have so many options and our teacher know, knows that there are so many options for knitting, it never occurred to me to ask her, how do you handle your floats? Like, I it just assumed it was going to be parallel. And she knits, as she said, the way her grandmother knit because her grandmother taught her to knit. But she's also aware that there are a lot of other different ways of knitting. But I don't think that she's done those and and doesn't maybe doesn't know that they make a difference like that that the results might be different like the whole yarn dominance thing I don't know so I'm gonna I'm really interested to go to the third class and and kind of nail down um, what it is she does I'm going to ask her to show to show us how she knits because I want to watch her and see what happens and I want to go look at all the samples that she always has these mittens and she shows them to us and I want to turn them inside out and look at the back and see how they were knit and I want to more directly ask some of the other women in the class who are of Latvian descent if they how they are knitting on the back I want to look at the backs of their um, mittens as well because this has just been such a revelation to me I just it's so exciting such an exciting week so again I'm going to leave links down to Ola Petter's um, master's thesis which I just think is so brilliant <laughs> he he says what's well, a little dry it's academic but I just thought it was great and then you know in the future in the coming couple of months I'm going to be doing a lot of experimenting with with uh, color work and the different techniques and I'll probably be doing some technique videos on them. I'm, I'm just so excited about this. I can hardly stand it. Uh, so, but that's it for this week, for this week's Casual Friday. Um, I'll see you uh, next week, either on Tuesday or next Friday. Thanks for watching.